Thank you very much for kind invitation. And I'm going to talk about classification of gap ground state phases in quantum spin system. So first, uh, what kind of classification problem it is? So uh, we consider a classification problem of Hamiltonians with a spectrum gap between the lowest eigenvalue and the rest of the spectrum. And uh, the classification criteria is as follows, uh, roughly. Uh, two capped Hamiltonians are equivalent if there exists a smooth path of gapped Hamiltonians connecting them. That is a classification criterion, and that kind of classification problem we would like to consider. Recalling that a uh, state, a uh, ground state with a spectrum um, gap shows exponential decay of correlation function, we can interpret a uh, gapped state as kind of normal phase, uh, very roughly. And in this sense, this is a classification of normal phases and looking for the connected component of normal phases. That's a kind of, of a classification problem I would like to consider in this talk. And furthermore, for, so that is a kind of a problem I'm interested in. And in this talk, we consider this problem in operator algebraic framework of quantum statistical mechanics. So that is our mathematical uh, framework. And the uh, advantage of operator algebraic framework is that we can treat infinite system directly. And the reason why we would like to consider, uh, why the, the reason why if, uh, being able to co consider infinite system directly can be seen as advantage is uh, because in our classification problem, there are object characterizing phases that can get a uh, mean, meaningful only when we consider infinite system. In other words, as this object become something trivial when we restrict them to finite system. So in this sense, uh, I sometimes feel, uh, I feel sad that some uh, considering infinite system is meaningful for uh, this classification problem. So, I'd like to do so in this talk. So first, I would like to uh, introduce this uh, mathematical framework. So with these small letters, I wrote a uh, corresponding thing in a finite dimensional uh, quantum mechanical system. So I introduce a sister dynamical system, which is a generalization of finite quantum mechanics. So the, uh, <laughs> In finite dimensional quantum mechanics, physical observable was given by MN, which I denote uh, in, by in matrix algebra. And so in finite quantum mechanics, most simple case, simple case N by N matrix uh, gives uh, a physical observable. And I would write in this, in, in this sister dynamical uh, framework, this uh, physical observable are replaced by general sister algebra. So MN is replaced by sister algebra, uh, which is a uh, Banahasta algebra with a norm satisfying this sister norm condition. And uh, our original N by N matrix, it is one, one kind of sister algebra uh, with respect to this uniform norm. So this is a generalization of our original setting of N by N matrices in quantum, finite dimensional quantum mechanics. So uh, also now uh, I would like to talk about phys physical states and recall that in physical uh, finite dimensional quantum mechanics, uh, physical states are given by this formula with density matrix rho here and uh, by this formula. And note that uh, this uh, map, uh, taking a procedure of taking expectation value uh, A, uh, expectation value of, of physical observable with respect to the state. This procedure has a for this map uh, satisfying the following condition that it is linear and positive. Uh, linear means uh, linear, but uh, positive means uh, if we put a star a here, then this is positive. 
So this is, this is a physical state in finite dimensional quantum space, quantum mechanics. And I would like to, we would like to uh, generalize to a uh, general shift algebra. Namely, we just take this abstract property uh, and define that such a map, such a map is a state. Uh, more precisely, a state omega over shift algebra is a linear functional over shift algebra A with norm one satisfying this positivity condition. So that is a definition of state in a dynamical system. And note that uh, recall that in physical state, uh, pure, uh, we say a uh, state is pure if this law is uh, given by a uh, one dimension, uh, one rank projection. But in other words, this uh, situation can be characterized that this state cannot be written as a convex combination of two different states. And uh, we don't have the projection or density matrix in infinite system. So we say that um, some state is pure uh, if this latter condition is satisfied. Namely, a state omega is pure if it can be, cannot be written as a convex combination of two different states. So that is a, a definition of state and its pureness. Now, as maybe you know, uh, there is a famous uh, about this state on shift algebra. Uh, there is a famous theorem uh, uh, that is called GNS representation, which basically tells us that for each state on a shift algebra, we can associate some representation on a Hilbert space of the shift algebra, essentially unique way. Uh, more precisely, let us try to look at this theorem. So uh, for each state omega on a shift algebra A, there exists a representation pi omega on a Hilbert space. And there is also some special unique vector in this Hilbert space satisfying this condition. So this is telling us that expectation value of A with respect to omega can be written like this in the, by these objects. And also this is a, this uh, uh, it also satisfies this condition, namely a vector of this form is dense in this uh, Hilbert space. And it says that uh, this uh, is unique up to unitary equivalence in the sense if there is another triple like this, then uh, this they can be related to each other by some unitary. And so it, in other words, it is essentially a unique way we can associate such a triple. And here I wrote the detail just to say that it, it, there is some concrete definition, but um, uh, this detail doesn't matter to, for my talk. And what I want, uh, to, I want you to uh, remember is that the, just that if, uh, for each state in, on a shift algebra, we can associate some kind of representation, a essentially unique way. I'm sorry, can I ask a question? Yes. Is this valid for any state or for pure states, this theory? Ah, sorry, sorry, any state. This is for any state. Hmm, okay. Okay. So when, when state is pure, it has more structure. It gets more structure, but it is holds for general state. Okay, so that is the uh, state and uh, or assist algebra, and we notice GNS representation. And now, a uh, time evolution I would like to consider, in, uh, which is given by Hamiltonian, of course, in a uh, finite dimensional quantum mechanics by this Heisenberg uh, evolu time evolution. But um, uh, in this sister uh, dynamical system framework, uh, it is given by sister dynamics, by which mean, by mean a strongly continuous one parameter group of automorphism, which is defined uh, like here. Uh, so it is a, a group homomorphism from R to automorphism group on sister algebra A, sat, uh, satisfying some uh, a proper continuity, namely uh, for each element A, this map is a uh, continuous with respect to the norm of the shift algebra. So uh, anyway, uh, so uh, instead of talking about Hamiltonian, we uh, consider this 
uh, abstract property of the uh, group action. So this is time evolution. Now, uh, this talk is about the ground state. I was talking about Hamiltonian who's, uh, with a gap between the lowest eigenvalue and death of the spectrum, uh, which means that I'm interested in ground state. And uh, so uh, it's called that in finite dimensional mechanics, uh, the ground state was defined in terms of Hamiltonian, of course, uh, which means that a uh, uh, state on n by n matrices is a ground state of this Hamiltonian and uh, means uh, this density matrix uh, has a support under this uh, project spectral projection of Hamiltonian corresponding to the lowest eigenvalue. So this was uh, the uh, ground state definition of a uh, infinite quantum mechanical system. But my uh, problem now is that uh, uh, we do not have Hamiltonian in this framework, uh, but we do have uh, time evolution. So uh, in this framework, for that reason, we talk about uh, we, uh, the ground state is defined in terms of uh, dynamics instead of Hamiltonian. So uh, here is the definition. So let A be a sister algebra and tau a sister dynamics on A. And let delta be the generator of this A sister dynamics. And a state omega over A is called a tau ground state if this condition, this inequality, holds for any element in the domain of delta, as a generator of the dynamics. So this is the definition of ground state in this operator algebraic framework, which uh, may look a bit uh, weird uh, uh, compared to this condition. But actually, if you consider this condition in our original setting where a dynamics is given by Hamiltonian, then you can uh, easily show that this condition of original condition of ground state is equivalent to this new condition. Uh, therefore, um, what I want to say is this uh, may look strange, but actually this is just a generalization of our usual definition of ground state, and it is uh, taken as a ground definition of ground state in this operator algebraic framework. Um, just a question, where does this generator live? In what space? Uh, this is, is a, a generator. Uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> it's an uh, um, operator on the sister algebra A. Um, the domain is uh, one which has this limit. So. Uh, I see. So you didn't, I because I thought maybe you were representing your dynamics on the GNS. Uh, no, uh, no, I'm not doing that this ah, time. Okay, okay. <laughs> Okay, thank you. So that is a sister dynamic color system, uh, the basic uh, situation. And um, now I would like, uh, as, as I said, uh, our problem is about gapped ground state phases. And um, uh, to, so what I, I have to specify what I mean by gapped ground state phases in uh, what I mean by gapped ground state in this framework. And in order to do that, I need the following proposition written here. And so let me explain this proposition. So let a uh, omega be a tau ground state for some sister uh, dynamics tau on some sister algebra. And uh, let h pi Omega be a GNS trip for the uh, canonical, uh, can canonical representation of a uh, sister algebra associated to our state bit, omega. And then the proposition tells us that there exists a unique positive operator H omega on this Hilbert space uh, satisfying this condition. So it's basically implementing the uh, dynamic style in this Hilbert space. So this uh, proposition tells us that uh, there is some, uh, we can associate uh, some uh, posit positive operator uniquely to each ground state. And I will call such a unique positive operator H omega the Hamiltonian associ associated with this state omega. So uh, this is a proposition. 
uh, with this proposition, I can now define what I mean by gap to current state in this talk. And we I define it as follows. We say that our sister dynamics has gap to current state if the following two conditions holds. So first condition is uh, the following. So it, because H omega satisfy uh, this condition, for example, putting one to here, and then it vanish. And uh, we see that uh, omega omega is invariant under this time evolution, which means in other words that omega omega is an eigenvalue or uh, eigenvector of its, it, this Hamiltonian corresponding to the eigenvalue zero. And this first condition is uh, that it is telling us that it is non-degenerated for pure state. Uh, so uh, let me read, for any tau ground state omega, zero is a non-degenerate eigenvalue of this Hamiltonian H omega. That is uh, our first condition. And second condition is that about the gap. So it says that there exists a constant gamma, positive gamma, gamma satisfying this condition uh, for any pure tau ground state omega. Uh, so here, sorry, uh, this H omega, uh, sigma H omega is a spectrum of our Hamiltonian associated to our ground state omega. And it's uh, here we are considering the uh, spectrum other than this uh, lowest eigenvalue. Zero. And it's, it's saying that there is a gap between the lowest eigenvalue and the rest of the spectrum uh, in, in this sense. So, this is a, a definition of gap to a ground state. Uh, can, can I ask a question? Yes. I don't understand the, the first part of the definition in physical terms. Can you explain, like, why do you need this condition? What does this mean in physical terms? Yes, uh, so very roughly, uh, state being able, to, the representation corresponds to macroscopic status of the uh, physical system. And so, sorry. Uh, We can define for for each element in so for each unit vector in this Hilbert space, we can consider this kind of functional. This also defines some uh, positive linear functional, which is normalized. So this defines a state on the schist algebra, and state given like this way we regard it being close to our original state omega. Such a state given like this form is uh, represented by, uh, is, we, we can interpret that they are physically, macroscopically negligible, the difference is uh, macroscopically the same. So, um, and here I'm considering this Hamiltonian in this GNS setting. And I'm considering the Hamiltonian's eigenvalue uh, zero. And if there exists other, uh, uh, other vector guzai, which is in the kernel of this H omega, it means this guzai is another ground state. So what I'm saying here is that there is no other ground state which is macroscopically the same as our ground state. That is a condition what I, the first uh, condition is telling. But can you give an example of some spin chain which violates this condition I? Because I'm, I'm familiar with the spin chains a little bit. But, uh... Uh, so, um, yes, uh, so we can consider using chain. Yeah where uh, all the, uh, there's all up uh, spin and all down spin ground state. And they are macroscopically different, right? 
Yeah. And so, but it, there is no other ground state which is uh, can be represented inside of this GNS representation. Okay, so that would be okay. That would pass your definition. Mm -hmm. But can you give an example of some spin chain which would not pass your definition? Yeah. So I don't really want to give you this, this, this. Uh, this. Uh, yeah. So there is X, X, Z model where we know there exists a kink, right? Mm -hmm. And this kink, this kink and that kink, they are macroscopically the same. The difference is only local around here. So I agree that it is does not cover all the ground state uh, definition, uh, gap ground state definition in usual physical sense, in the sense that I would like to eliminate the possibility of degeneracy of ground state, which are macroscopically the same. So yeah, anyway, the answer to the data question is XXZ. Uh, with this kink should not satisfy this condition. Okay. Okay, yeah. thanks. So uh, in this talk, uh, we are interested in sister dynamics on quantum spin system. Uh, so, 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 so far I talked only about uh, sister dynamics in general setting, but I would like to, to actually what we would like to consider is a quantum spin system in this talk. And uh, of course, it, it the dynamics have to be constructed from physical model. So it, it should be given by uh, some, uh, something called interaction. And that is what I would like to explain next. So probably it's not that necessary, uh, I don't know. Uh, so let me start. So uh, throughout my talk that we are fixed term natural number D and let nu be a special dimension. And a new dimensional quantum spin system is the sister zero, uh, which is given as an infinite tensor product of D by D matrices like this. And we can do, uh, so we uh, if it is a product of D by D matrices along new dimensional uh, uh, lattice. And uh, for each gamma in the uh, subset, gamma subset of new dimensional lattice, we can do the same thing, namely we do a tensor D by D matrices along this gamma and obtain some sister algebra A gamma. And this A gamma is naturally regarded as a subalgebra of our new dimensional quantum spin system. So, uh, and of course, we uh, probably it's not necessary, but uh, we, we say that we uh, observable in here uh, is localized in this gamma or has a support in gamma or so on. And a uh, physical model are uh, given by interaction. Uh, and uh, in this framework, when I, when I say interaction, it is it, it stated a little bit formally, uh, namely an interaction is a map phi from the set of finite subset of new dimensional lattice to our quant new dimensional quantum spin system uh, and uh, satisfying this condition. And uh, namely, of course, it uh, so each uh, x finite subset of new dimensional lattice x we assign some interaction time phi x corresponding to interaction between spins inside of x and so therefore it should be self adjoint and it should be localized in x in the sense it is it belongs to this uh, subalgebra And uh, out of this interaction, we would like to construct some uh, some uh, dynamics, and in, that's not for me to do so. Uh, we need to require some physically reasonable locality condition for us to define the dynamics out of interaction. And so we we require some uh, additional condition. For example, we. Uh, require a finite range in uniformly bounded interaction in this sense. 
And uh, from this uh, interaction, uh, we so from such uh, interaction with suitable locality, uh, we uh, construct a uh, Dicester dynamics. And uh, in order to do so, first we define local Hamiltonian, uh, namely that the uh, summation of all the interaction term inside of each finite set lambda. And out of that, we define uh, Heisenberg dynamics and take the thermodynamic limit, and namely lambda goes uh, well, the <laughs> thermodynamic limit. And if our interaction is nice one, like uh, uniformly bounded and finite range, or other some sort of locality condition that is satisfied, then this limit is known to exist, and that defines the system dynamics on a new dimensional quantum spin system, and that is the system dynamics we are interested in. Um, sorry, I'm having a little trouble understanding the physical definition of this interaction. If you give me like a subset, like just a couple of points near each other, what is the meaning of phi of x? Am, am I supposed to think of that as like some interacting Hamiltonian that relates all of like that interacts between exactly those points in that subset? Uh, it's, what do you mean I use actually, sorry. Um, what is the meaning of phi of x? Phi of x is, is the is interaction it? between spins inside of x. So, so, why, so why, if, why would it be a finite range if I take an x and let's say the diameter is big? I mean, why would I expect it to be zero? Isn't it still going to interact in some local regions? I, I'm reading, writing here just an example of some locality condition. So even if it's not finite range, it should decay some proper way, right? And uh, this is just an example, and you can generalize it to accommodate a little bit more long range uh, interaction. Uh, but I, as this is easiest one, I wrote it. But in general, it's not necessary. I see. OK, thank you. So. Uh, now, uh, so as I said, uh, we are interested in this sister dynamics tau phi given by an interaction phi uh, with uh, gap, uh, and this is a kind of interactions and uh, we are interested in gap to ground state of such a uh, dynamics. And thinking about such a system, we recall, recall that there is some uh, a nice property, namely the ground state satisfy exponential decay of correlation function, which is known as a theorem here in this setting. So let phi be a uniformly bounded finite density interaction with kept ground states. Then uh, in the state pass, it is shown that the correlation functions of, of any pure tau phi ground state decays exponentially fast. Uh, namely, uh, if uh, let x and y be some finite region, fi uh, uh, disjoint region, and let's say a is localized in x and b is localized in y, and we consider the correlation function. And uh, this theorem tells us this correlation function decays exponentially fast with respect to the distance between x and y, that is uh, some uh, common sense, I guess, in physics, but um, it, is, it can be is proven in this paper as a theorem as well. So uh, we have such a, a property of a kept ground state. So exponential decay of correlation function make us feel that uh, these ground gap ground states are kind of normal phase. And that kind of normal phase we would like to classify uh, now. That kind of classification we are interested in. So a uh, classification of gap ground state phases. Uh, so in this classification problem, we are interested in a uniformly bounded finite mean density interaction with gap ground states. That a kind of set we are uh, interested in. And as I said, because of the exponential decay of correlation function of pure gap ground state physically, we de more or less regard this P as a normal phases. Uh, uh, sorry, I have a question. So in, in your definition of the set P, then the, the gap can be arbitrarily small, right? Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, then, then it's possible that uh, um, 
then if, if uh, then you can you can you can you can get uh, um, a bunch of files with smaller and smaller uh, gap. Then it 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 might uh, it might look like uh, some uh, gapless ground state. Is it possible? Uh, actually, it's included in the uh, classification criterion, uh, which will come next. That's mm -hmm. that. Ne so, namely, basically, we consider this kind of a uh, classification. So, uh, we introduce uh, the following classification that uh, two interactions are, we say, they are equivalent. And if we can connect them smoothly via a pass inside of P, and I'm writing here smoothly, very roughly, but actually this contains more condition indeed, as you said, that uh, we say that two interactions are equivalent if we manage to connect them uh, in a path inside of here, while the gap on the path should be a uh, strictly bounded from below by some strictly positive number. So the, the, the yeah, okay. So I, okay. I'm I'm requiring some pass existence of smooth pass uh, of interactions uh, connecting this phi one and phi two. Sorry, it's very bad notation, but uh, t equal one is a uh, phi one and t equal two, <laughs> two t equal one is phi two, sorry. So anyway, it's in a path of interaction connecting phi one and phi two. And the mean in this smoothness, which I didn't really write it down, uh, uh, contains a condition that, so each phi t, which has some gap by definition, and I'm requiring this infimum of gamma t to be strictly positive along the path. So uh, that um, so in this sense we don't uh, regard two interaction which is a uh, connected by pass of interaction in this set but not satisfying this one being equivalent. So yeah, okay. Um, actually, about that, won't that condition always be satisfied? I, I don't know that I don't know the topology. I'm assuming you're going to get to it in a moment. But even before the topology, if if zero one is compact, so its infimum is always is always greater than zero, right? Uh, so yeah, I, I couldn't understand. Is, isn't the infimum over a continuous path into a space? Mm -hmm. um, isn't uh, this the continuity of gamma t is quite hard, hard analytical problem. So so I. That would be great. That is the case, but for the moment, I don't know. So I, 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 we assume this. I guess I misunderstood. Then smoothness in this case is not stronger than continuous. Uh, it uh, continuous smoothness uh, means that you know this. Sorry, it's all because I didn't write the conditions. Uh, Precisely, so each finite subset uh, in no-dimensional lattice, we have this matrix valued uh, uh, pass, right? Smooth means this map is smooth. Ah, uh, okay, okay, thank you. So. I have to say uh, that's not the whole thing I hide it from you, but uh, there is more uh, condition and I, because of analytical technical reason we have to uh, require. And some of them like pointed at here, it's uh, something essentially important. And if you want to know the detail, please look at my paper with Alvin Moon well, and, and to know that why uh, such a condition, uh, what is the condition and why such a condition is required, please look at this paper. That's, that's interesting. So, I mean, so um, 
I've been to a few like condensed matter physics talks where they usually have the same similar condition, but they're actually talking about specific like Hamiltonians. So they connect the actual Hamiltonians on your system. And can you indicate just uh, intuitively why you're replacing that picture with this one where you're, you're not just looking at Hamiltonians, but you're actually looking at these um, more fundamental maps, these maps phi. Well, it's the same. It's same, but uh, as I said in the beginning, we we uh, Hamiltonian is not well defined in the infinite system, so that's all. Uh, okay, uh, Arthur, if I can comment, Arthur, this phi is a term in the Hamiltonian. Oh yes, yes. So it's like the Hamiltonian you can think as naively as a sum of all of these phi's over translations. I so, see. Yeah, so it's I, I think it's identical to the definition that you may have seen in physics talk. Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So uh, that is a classification we would like to consider and very roughly two interaction can which are equivalent, but by the way, I will write like this uh, when two interactions are equivalent and we it, with two interaction A, which are equivalent can be moved to each other without experiencing phase transitions. So that is the classification we would like to consider. And the question here is what are the invariant of this classification? So that is a kind of quest, uh, question I would like to know, but uh, how we can do it is uh, a priori not very much clear. Uh, and there is some uh, theorem to help us for such kind of analysis, which is called automorphic equivalence in the field. So let me explain about it. So for each interaction phi, I denote by G phi the set of all tau phi ground state. And this, uh, the automorphic equivalence is a theorem uh, the written here, uh, which says the following. Suppose that phi zero and phi one in this set P, which you'd like to classify, you have to A interactions. Uh, suppose that phi zero and phi one are equivalent, then there exists, uh, the theorem tells us that there exists an automorphism which incorporates the ground state of the first interaction G phi, uh, phi zero and ground state of the second interaction phi one, which interpolate these interactions they exist. And that is an automorphic equivalence, but actually uh, it's not that there exists some uh, uh, automorphism interpolating these two sets, but uh, actually this alpha automorphism connecting them uh, has a very nice property, namely it, it belongs to a nice class of automorphism, which I wrote Q out here. So uh, let me define, uh, explain what I mean by Q out. By Q out, at me, I mean that automorphism given by time dependent interactions. Uh, so, uh, let me uh, explain, but uh, first time dependent interaction is just like we did before, we considered before, uh, it's a, a pass of interaction parameterized by T. So it is, a, a, and so that uh, phi be a such a continuous pass of interactions. And out of interaction for each time T, we can do the same procedure uh, defining to define local Hamiltonian. And we can consider the solution of this differential equation. And before it was a, this was a not a time, independ a time dependent. This was time depend independent before. So as a result, we obtained some a, a Heisenberg dynamics like this. But now we are considering a, a, in a, a time dependent ones. So uh, in general, it may not be that form, but what the, we are doing here is the same as we did to construct system dynamical system. And so we, anyway, we consider this solution and take the thermodynamic limit. And as again, if uh, our interaction, pass of interaction is not local enough, then this limit exists and define a, a, a stringly continuous pass of automorphism. And 
What I mean by this Q out is the automorphism uh, given in this manner uh, with some, some of the and uh, some, some parts of phi. So uh, that is Q out. In a word, it is automorphism given by time dependent interaction as analog of a sister dynamical system, uh, sister dynamics given by interactions. So uh, what this theorem is saying that uh, the if phi zero and phi one are equivalent, then the corresponding ground state can be interpreted by uh, some automorphism which is, uh, belongs to this class. And so this class become very important and its property become important for us. So I would like to take a little bit more time to, and I'll see what uh, kind of automorphism it is. Yeah, but I, can you give us an idea? I mean, is this an, an important, uh, yeah, why is this a non-trivial theorem on the previous page? What's the difficulty in showing this? Like what's, yeah, what, I'm not sure I understand what's the big deal. Can you give some idea? Um, <laughs> what's a big deal? Why is like, this not obvious? So it seems like you are almost guaranteed if you define alpha as equation. Um, what can go wrong? What what do you have to find against when you prove this theorem? Um, <laughs> well, it's it's natural, but it's it's maybe not that true. To prove something which look natural doesn't really mean we don't need to do anything. So no, no, of course. I'm sure you have to do a lot of things, but I was just wondering what's the main difficulty? What is the main problem here in, in proving something like that? Main difficulty. Well, just idea is quite simple because of the gap. The, the we can. Uh, construct some differential equation uh, connecting ground state uh, state uh, and yeah so actually I don't I don't I don't know how to answer. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, Slava, if I may try to intervene, um, I suspect the difficulty is that uh, you want to actually construct a, a solution, a time-dependent Schrodinger equation, but if the Hamiltonian is gapped at all time, you have the adiabatic theorem that tells you that, uh, uh, okay, if you go infinitely slowly, you stay in the ground state manifold, but here you want to, to, to get to uh, your new ground state by a finite time evolution. So you have to kill all the uh, non-adiabatic effects, which I think can be done because the gap exists at all time, but um, you need a bit of uh, fine tuning probably of the time dependent Hamiltonian so that you uh, don't get any uh, virtual excitation above the gap at any time. Uh, I don't know if this helps. So, so you, yeah, that, that's something that I did not indeed uh, appreciate. So this path, yeah, Yoshiko, can you say this path phi of x t that appears on this slide, is it something is it something that has to be chosen very carefully or is it something you just choose the, the same path which comes from the definition of the fact that phi zero is equivalent to phi one? Ah, no, uh, okay. Uh, the path uh, giving this automorphism is different from the path this is given by this one. We, I see. Using this uh, existence of gap, we cook up so let's say this is given by phi t, then we cook up some other inter path of interaction, depending, uh, in introducing the information of gap or whatever. I see. Yeah, okay, this is something good. Th th thanks, no, that was a very, yeah, now I, I see the point. Uh, thanks okay. a lot. Thank you very much. <laughs> thanks. Okay, so now I'd like to explain what is a, uh, but I have only, 10 minutes left, so I'm not sure. <laughs> so let me skip this part. 
but with some reason, uh, so maybe I did only this part. So uh, for if our uh, interaction is on-site, then uh, in a, namely, if I xt is zero, if x contains more than one point, then autom corresponding automorphism become an infinite tensor product form, which does not create any uh, ent entanglement at all between sides, different sides. And, uh, but in general, uh, it's not that uh, extreme situation. It's not on-site interaction in general, our, this our pass, it has more tail. Uh, as a result, we may a little bit more create uh, entanglement, but uh, for some observe, from some observation, physically we can uh, conclude that it does uh, construct entanglement, but maybe not short length, uh, not long length one. So uh, there is some indication we can ask, uh, uh, in my, uh, uh, interpret as an alpha in this class, not uh, uh, generating, uh, not uh, creating long range entanglement. And as a result, uh, from based on such, uh, such observation, I would like to define short range entanglement and long range entanglement as follows. Uh, namely, a state omega, which can be written as this form where Omega zero is just infinite tensor product a state, which does not have any entanglement between different sides times alpha, which is a automorphism of our, our uh, class uh, Q old, uh, which does not create entanglement. And so we say that a, a state a, which can be written in this form have a short range entanglement, and we say it otherwise it has long range entanglement. So a, that was a remark about this property of uh, Q old, and recall that we are interested in uh, we uh, our question was what is the invariant of our classification, and and there were, uh, and uh, let us come back to this question. And then the automorphic equivalence was telling that if two inductions are equivalent, then they, they interpolate the corresponding ground state of via uh, uh, automorphism in this uh, class Q out. And uh, from this uh, theorem, we can conclude that we can see that. Um, if uh, you uh, if some object is stable under this alpha uh, under any alpha in this class of automorphism, then uh, from this theorem we can conclude that it is an invariant of our classification. So what I want to say is to uh, find invariant, uh, we what we should do is to find some object stable under this uh, automorphism in Q. Out. And that is a hint, and that, that is what we would like, to, we, we should do apparently, but uh, how we can do, and uh, uh, what to do, we always tell, uh, physicists tell us uh, that uh, in this case, uh, physicists talk about string like excitation, which is any, uh, string like excitation, like any. And uh, in fact, in this Kitai quantum double model, Kitai uh, derived uh, any onic like a uh, string like excitation. Uh, and uh, the physicist always tell us that this uh, anions uh, or strike like excitations are uh, invariant of the, that classification. And classification. And uh, Kitai also talked about super selection sector in his uh, uh, papers. And, uh, and uh, because of that, uh, we, uh, and Peter Nakins showed that, uh, showed that uh, Kitai's quantum double models, this string like excitation can be understood as a kind of super selection sector. But the, uh, the difference between Kitai and Nakins, maybe he's 
considering it in operator algebraic framework, which we are working on. So uh, based on him, Nakin's work, we think that a super selection sector in operator algebraic sense should be an invariant. So what I, uh, next I would like to think now is the super selection sector in operator algebraic sense. So, so let me define it here. So let H pi zero be an irreducible representation of no dimensional quantum spin system. We say a representation pi of no dimensional lattice satisfies super selection criterion for pi zero if this uh, condition holds for any con uh, lambda in new dimensional quantum spin system. So here con means that, so let's say this is axis and any uh, element which has a, a angle with uh, theta between uh, this axis, uh, the set of such point is uh, by is called, called con in this context. So uh, we see a representation pi of new dimensional uh, quantum spin system satisfies super selection sector if uh, this condition holds for any such con. Uh, let us look at what this condition. Here we are considering the complement of uh, this con. And we are restricting our representation pi and pi zero to our complement. And the uh, requirement is their unitary equivalence. You could you, you dot e dot means unitary equivalence. Namely, there is some unitary in the Hilbert space, uh, which uh, satisfy this uh, condition. So uh, this is the definition of super uh, selection criterion. And uh, we say such uh, we say that such kind of representation or a representation of super selection sector for pi zero. And uh, this is the definition of super selection sector in a uh, operator algebraic framework. And uh, based on Nakin's uh, observation about a uh, quantum double model, uh, we expect that uh, such a thing uh, should be um, invariant of our classification. And from our previous all, uh, observation based on uh, automorphic equivalence, uh, what we have to do is that this is uh, super selection sectors are invariant, uh, uh, stable under uh, this structure of super selection sectors are stable under our automorphism in this class. That is what we have to do uh, to show that super selection sector, uh, super selection st structures are uh, invariant of our classification. And uh, this theorem written here says that is the case. Okay, so, uh, so it, it let me, uh, he uh, let H pi zero be an irreducible representation and let alpha be a, a automorphism uh, from this class. And suppose that a representation pi satisfy a super selection criterion for pi zero. Uh, then uh, pi alpha satisfies as a super selection sector criterion for pi zero alpha, which means the following. So, when alpha maps this representation pi zero to pi zero alpha, it maps the corresponding super selection sectors to corresponding super selection sectors. So there is bijection given by this alpha between the super selection sector pi zero uh, or pi zero and pi zero alpha. In other words, this uh, super selection sectors are uh, structure of super selection sectors are. Uh, invariant of the classification. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt you again, but uh, can you explain why cone is a natural set to consider in this context? Why, yeah. why cone and not some other set? Like why not cylinder or whatever? Or, or uh, a ball? Why, why is it a cone? Because, yeah, why, why is a cone? Yes. Um, in quantum spin system, uh, you know, uh, this automorphism, uh, when it acts on some, some uh, 
region, then there is time. Uh, so there is, you know, the Robinson bound. So there is a speed of a trans, a speed of transportation. Uh, namely, uh, when we, so for, for example, when, when we map. No, there is, I mean, if you involve time, I understand there's a cone, but here there's no time. You said cone lambda in Z nu, and nu is just spatial coordinates. Yes. Where's um, time in this definition? I don't see time. Yes. Um, but you see, we are considering this kind of map. And this is given by time ever, uh, time independent uh, interaction, uh, which we can regard as time evolution. And uh, this cone shape analytically as it is technically fit very well with this analysis of this Q out because it has some finite time, uh, finite velocity for the time evolution. So for Why example- velocity? Uh, this cone lives on a spatial lattice. Where is velocity? Yeah, maybe I didn't understand what the cone means. So, yeah. Yeah, what cone itself is not super uh, important. You can part up cone if you want. But the reason why technically convenient to consider this cone is because uh, if you apply this alpha to some observable localized in this cone area, then you can approximate it with uh, some automorphism localized in a little bit larger cone. Can you draw the coordinates on this drawing? Where is time? Where is x? So I didn't understand. So you draw the cones, but I don't understand. Ah, here it is just special, uh, special. Yeah, but why are you calling the speed of propagation if it's just spatial? Again, this, how about we forget about time? That was my mistake. Okay, 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 <laughs> okay. So, suppose, okay. Are, suppose we are in 1D, suppose they are in 1D, then what is this cone? Is it just half left, half axis? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, sounds good, thanks. <laughs> okay. So uh, my uh, my conclusion is that the super selection sector is uh, is uh, some invariant of our classification, but and and furthermore using this uh, uh, fact that uh, that this uh, super selection uh, super selection sectors are stable under our uh, our Q out. Uh, we can also show that short range entanglement in para is a trivial uh, sector theory, uh, namely trivial sector theory you can regard as a non existence of trivial and uh, non trivial union. And uh, they are corollary like that. And furthermore, <laughs> sorry, I, I think I, I need to conclude now. So let me conclude that the first. Uh, this uh, super selection sector is invariant of uh, our classification. Uh, that's one thing. And also, we, I, I don't have a time to explain, but this super selection criterion, uh, uh, super selection sector, we can interpret uh, that any is a kind of a super selection sector because we can derive some mathematical object called graded sister tensor category. Out of this super selection sector, uh, which actually maybe you know uh, because many uh, paper uh, about AQFT. Uh, do this kind of thing a lot. And uh, so, uh, but the, what I want to emphasize is that our setting is different from AQFT, but nevertheless, we can still derive some uh, breeding structure which uh, out of super selection sectors. And sorry, uh, it's a bit. <laughs> uh,
I, I'm a bit out of time, so I would like to stop here. Sorry. Yeah, thank you very much for attention. Thank you, Yoshika. So uh, you've been asking questions. Uh, let's see if um, you have uh, the audience has more questions, please. Um, I, I was a little curious about that last comment you made because you had introduced this definition in terms of these cones, uh, but initially the motivation was you wanted to capture Katayev's um, notion of anions in your definition of super selection sectors. And I'm assuming that very last thing you said towards the end of the talk was addressing that. So you, is that, is that right? Ah, uh, yes. Uh, basically we can say this. Uh, so uh, braided sister tensor category in AKFT setting is direct. Uh, is given roughly like this. So super selection sector is object and morphism are intertwined, which means uh, the uh, bounded operators uh, which satisfy this condition for its super selection sector for sigma. And uh, in this uh, framework, uh, we can, uh, they can extend the, uh, you know, super selection sector is originally just a, a representation of uh, at least in quantum spin system, it is just a representation of uh, a sister algebra, uh, but uh, it can be, so it, there is no composition in, in, in the beginning, but um, it can be extended to uh, endomorphism on larger sister algebra so that uh, you can consider a uh, defined uh, composition. That kind of thing is done here. And furthermore, you can define direct sum and you can also define sub object and you can define a uh, braiding. And so all the structure code a uh, braided sister tensor category, uh, it can be derived out of this uh, super selection sector based on DHR theory. And uh, the setting of AQFT is a little bit different from our setting. Uh, and so technically we need to work as a little bit different thing, but uh, nevertheless, the basic basic recipe works uh, for quantum spin system, and we can derive such a this sort of thing out of uh, our gapped ground state cases. I see. Thank you. I I have a question. Uh, so. Um, these theorems that uh, you and other people proved. So can can we consider, given these theorems, that you know, in some dimensions, perhaps in one dim in one dimension or in two dimension, I don't know, uh, the gapped phases have been classified fully, or is it or is this problem not yet fully solved? Uh, it's not fully solved at, at all. <laughs> but can you? Yeah, it was not clear. It was not clear to me like how far we are from solving this problem in some particular dimensions. Like, what is the what yeah. is the main difficulty to, to, towards the full classification? Is there some? I mean, I'm not sure you can yeah the problem summarize it, but if you can say something, I'd be curious to know. Uh, for, maybe it depends on. If, to whom you ask, but for me it looks very difficult mm -hmm. we are far because uh, our classification problem is based on the gap uh, or the path of, of Hamiltonian with gap. And yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, I only is, consider gap, gap. Yeah. yeah. Let's, let's... See, this is really hard analytical problem, and and so basically, we, if you want to show that this and this with the same index has can be connected to each other, you have to construct some uh, pass of gap Hamiltonian, which means that, uh, it, and but in general to show existence of gap is really hard problem and so. Yeah, yeah, that I understand, that I know the fact that uh, mm -hmm. in practice it's very hard to show that there's a gap. But but leaving this problem aside, you know, if we knew how to show 
for any Hamiltonian if it has gapped or not. Mm -hmm. But do we know like how many classes are there or something like that? Uh, yeah. Uh, from this point of view. Like, do we have the full list of invariants, for example? Perhaps it follows from your theorems, but I'm, I'm not sure I... Yeah, uh, I I don't know. So so basically, you are asking if this is the only invariant that is what you are asking. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, uh, um, in this general direction, could you say something about this? Personally, no. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> but if you consider, it, of course, people talk about. Uh, modular tensor category and I often see that people are claiming modular tensor category plus conformal charge are completely invariant but I, I never understand why. Um, I don't know if this is a related question but um, which which is easier to compute in this case because I'm not really you know, I don't know how to compute either of these to whether, whether to check um, whether, you know, there exists such an alpha or whether to check um, that the two resulting braided C star tensor categories are monoidally equivalent. How can you say something about how easy it is to check either of those conditions? What, what do you mean, how hard uh, in which situation? Uh, um, I, I guess. Well, I'm not really sure, but I mean, maybe if you're looking at a particular example, you have a system in mind, um, is it easier to construct such an alpha? It, it's, suppose, suppose these things are related, you just need to prove it. Is it easier to generally construct such an alpha that exhibits, um, that exhibits this um, equivalence? Or is it easier to prove that the resulting C star tensor categories are monoidally equivalent? Right, because I mean, like in, in modular, uh, I believe it's in modular tensor categories, you have like these, you know, these things that you can just compute, right? Kind of like analogous to the algebra brackets. Um, and I thought that, you know, if maybe I'm thinking of the wrong word, but they're usually like um, invariants you just compute. Um, I, I, but I don't know how easy it is to, to do it in this, in this setting. Uh, if you are talking about this setting, this monoidal equivalence is given by this alpha using this alpha, so. But it's, uh, yeah, but it's not an if and only if, right? Your statement goes in one direction. If omega phi two equals omega phi one composed of alpha, then mm -hmm. the C star tensor categories are monoidally equivalent. So it yeah. tells you if I can prove, um, sorry, if I can um, prove that they're not monoidally equivalent, then I know that there exists no such alpha, yeah. right? Yes. So maybe my question is, is it easier to prove that these categories are not monoidally equivalent, or is it easier just to prove that no such alpha exists by some other means? Oh. Well, I don't know. I, I think to derive this sister tensor category is highly, in concrete, in concrete example, is highly non-trivial issue, I think. So, yeah. Uh, uh, both sounds hard for me. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, thank you. Okay. Other questions? Well, actually, uh, a sort of uh, basic physics question. You mentioned that uh, uh, the, mm -hmm. the, the axiomatic quantum field theory setting and the, the, the setting of uh, spin systems uh, or have to be handled differently from the mathematical viewpoint. Uh, what is uh, uh, the phenomenon that uh, causes this difference? Because, uh, okay, you, we may naively think that, um, is it because uh, your systems are defined on a lattice and quantum field theory is usually, usually defined on a continuous space or is it uh, uh, something else? What makes these two settings uh, uh, different when you try to prove these uh, theorems? Mm, uh, to prove theorems, um, 
in, in a sense, um, this uh, AQFT is quite clean area with nice assumption, which is reasonable only in a QFT setting. But our physical uh, uh, quantum lattice system, it is which where dynamics is given by these interactions, it's kind of messy. And uh, so there's causal, like a nice causal con in, in, in IQFT, but we, we do have, as I said before, we do have some uh, time evolution, but there is always error going out of this con, which okay. cause some mess for us. Ah, okay. okay. This has a difference, but yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, thanks. Okay. Maybe I'll ask a question. Could you please show back the slide where you have had a theorem about uh, Z2 lattice? Uh, yeah, oh, yes, yes, this one. Yes, yes, perfect. So, uh, so, let me ask what happens if we replace this dimension two by another dimension. First of all, what's analog of this theorem in dimension one and, and what happens in higher dimensions? Uh, I think things should work well as well, actually, for general dimension. It's just that I wrote this paper with the dimension because it's easier to to write it down, but basically, I, I think everything goes fine with higher dimension. The only pro thing is that this braiding, which we can define everywhere, but in higher dimension, it becomes trivial because braiding two twice in higher dimension. Gets yes, back. exactly. So braiding becomes trivial. Is there any like higher non-trivial thing remains? Sorry? Uh, does there remain some kind of higher non-trivial thing if braiding becomes trivial? But is there some kind of higher structure like what people discuss in you know, topological field theories and uh, uh, just, just uh, trying to ask what, 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 what do you expect in higher dimensions as analog of this statement? I don't know, actually. Uh, actually, just looking at that, I'm not sure if we can derive some something but oh, okay if you go to one dimension what happens in one dimension in one dimension yeah, just one dimensional let's say spin chain what would be the theorem about it uh, in one dimension yes so if we take spin chain in one dimension ah there is no non-trivial sector theory So okay. everything is trivial. Okay. Mm. Because it's in one dimension is the system is almost like tensor product of left infinite chain, right infinite chain. Yes. And uh, so the ground state structure is like a, this tensor product form, which uh, means that um, super selection sector is trivial. Mm -hmm. So. Okay, and maybe also I'll ask like in this way. So suppose I bound the range of interaction by some finite number. Let's say I consider just nearest spin interaction or next to the nearest. So then the space of phi's is, is just some finite dimensional space, right? And in this finite dimensional space, we consider um, points which are equivalent by path uh, with, your, with your condition. So if I fix some very low number uh, for dimension new and uh, the range of interaction, let's say one or two, I have I have just finite dimensional space to study. Can we make complete classification of their sectors that exist in this space? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Uh, I, I don't know. Not even like in dimension one or two and let's say nearest interaction. That would be, it mm. still looks to me like some finite dimensional problem to study. Yeah. No, no, uh, no not, not, I don't know, sorry. <laughs> Maybe okay. it is, but. Okay. okay. All right.
Um, anything else? Or if not, maybe we'll be wrapping up. Slava? Yeah, I'm, I have no further question. Thanks, uh, Yoshika, again for your nice talk. Thank you. Thanks okay. for joining us from so okay. far away. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for the invitation.